Today we are joined by Heather Corinna, the creator of Scarletine.com, one of the first and longest running web-based organizations providing sex, sex education online. Heather is also the author of a popular young adult sexuality and relationship guide, SEX, the All You Need to Know Sexuality Guide to Get You Through Your Teens and Twenties, and a writer and contributing, and she is also a writer and contributing editor for the 2011 edition of Our Bodies, Ourselves. Heather has been an alternative and award-winning educator since the early 90s, most recently honored with the Joan Helmick Educator of the Year Award the Woodhull Foundation's Vicky Award, the Steinman Waters Award, and the Golden Brook Award. They've written for or been featured in numerous publications such as the Utna Reader. Sorry about that, Heather. You can correct that. No worries. The Seattle Post-Intelligencer, the Chicago Tribune, CNN, the Nation's Feministing, the Minnesota Women's Press, the Boston Phoenix, Ms. Magazine, the New York Times, Boston Bitch. Thank you, Heather, for presenting today with us, and I turn it over to you. Okay, thanks. I'm sorry that you, you had to read that. <laughs> yeah. um, that's a lot. Uh, I'm, I just want to kind of say from the front that I'm so grateful that all of you are here, this kind of particular arena and set of topics is one of the nearest and dearest to my heart professionally and then also to me personally as a survivor myself. So um, I'm really glad that you're here. I'm really glad that you're interested. I'm really glad that you're not so nervous or intimidated about even thinking about doing this kind of work that you were willing to come here today. Um, and find out a little bit about how I think I can help you um, do it well. So um, one of the big things before we get started is there are a bunch of different attached files um, with this. And just so you know what those are, there's two larger pieces that um, I'm going to kind of summarize in short here. Um, that's the key domains of healthy sexual development piece, and then a larger version of um, a piece by uh, Karen Rain. There's also um, a piece by C.J. Pasco on youth sexuality and new media. It's you know a pretty serious overview, but I think for anyone who needs it, it's helpful. There's a sexuality overview of young adults in the United States from the Guttmacher Institute. It also breaks up kind of more parts of this that we didn't really have time for today, like talking about um, safer sex and contraceptive compliance, um, a lot more about um, kind of romantic relationships and, and peer interactions that I'm going to have time to talk for today. Guttmacher does one of these um, every couple of years, sometimes a little more frequently. If you ever kind of want a quick way to identify some, you know, fast facts when it comes to young adult sexuality in the United States, it's a really great um, resource for that. You also have a short resource list, and then there's the values clarification sheet. So we weren't quite sure if everyone was going to have time to do that or even kind of see that that was a thing to do before we started today. So what I'd like to do right now is just let you take a couple of minutes. Um, if you did do it, you can just take your couple of minutes and have your tea and settle into your chair a little bit more. If you didn't do it, just take a minute or two Look at what the questions are. If you don't have it printed out, that's fine. You don't, you don't have to keep this. It's just to walk yourself through it and answer the questions for yourself is what matters. There aren't right or wrong answers with the values clarification if you haven't done one before. This is really just for you. You don't have to share these results with anything. It's just some touchstones for you to take stock of your attitudes and ideas particularly around survivor sexuality and then also adolescent sexuality. And then just kind of, you know, this is, a, this is a helpful thing for you to kind of keep for yourself and maybe revisit from time to time just to also identify areas where you might have bias. You know, we all have biases. There's no such thing as a human being without a bias. Having bias isn't 
a problem. It's lack of awareness of bias that's a problem and then not realizing that it's something for us to, to manage. So just take a minute. I'll be quiet for, for a minute or two. So if you didn't go through it and fill it out, you can do that for yourself right then. And then just whenever you're done, just kind of sit with it for a minute so you have a picture of where you're starting here today. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and move forward. Um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're still pondering, ponder away. I want to, before I start to kind of fill you in on, on two things I think are really important. You know, one of the biggest questions that we often get from young people at Scarletine is, what is sex, right? Which <laughs> is, um, is a big question. Um, and is also a question with a really unique answer. There's, there's no one thing that's, that's sex. There's mostly just how we experience this thing that we all kind of generalize as a mutually wanted, shared, and active expression of sexuality or sexual desire. Um, and by that same token and related to it, this differentiates sexual abuse and assault, rape, from sex really clearly. Um, for someone who's sexually abused or assaulted, that's not a mutually wanted, shared, and active expression of their sexuality that has nothing to do with their sexual desire. It doesn't tell the person who's assaulting them or abusing them anything about their sexuality or sexual desire. Um, at, the, at the most, at the very best, um, we can perhaps sometimes say that that can be an expression of the sexuality of the perpetrator, but even then we know that there's a lot of kinds of sexual abuse and assault, if not most kinds, that really are not so much about sexual desire as they are about power. Um, and this message, too, is something that um, I keep, I'm, I'm not sure why people still aren't getting it, but it, it's clear that when we say this to somebody, this is often really watershed. It's never something they've had someone tell them before, or if someone has told them before, they haven't sounded particularly clear or convinced of it. And it's a very empowering thing, particularly if you have the idea or the, fee or the experience that, your, that sexual abuse or assault basically robbed your sexuality from you or it forced you to share your sexuality with somebody else. So this message that says this isn't about that, that's still all yours, that's still yours to share, and if you don't share, somebody doesn't get to have it, can really be a big place to start from to make somebody feel like they still have something that they just kind of assumed, particularly around people's messaging um, with sexual abuse and assault, was lost for them forever. Um, so that's, that's, my big, that's my big cheerlead um, with this. So the first thing that I want to go into today is to talk about um, the, what's, called, what's called the key domains of healthy sexual development. I'm taking this list, it's a smaller list from a larger piece done by an interdisciplinary group in Australia um, a handful of years ago, five, six, seven years ago. Um, and uh, there's a larger piece, this is another one of the attached files to this that you can look at to get the bigger thing. 
when I first saw it, I thought it was the, like the best thing ever. Um, even kind of in the sexual health community and sexology communities, it's really hard for us to often have consensus about what we mean when we talk about healthy sexuality and what we mean when we talk about healthy sexual development. And obviously this can get particularly problematic if and when people have the idea or cultures are sending the message, for instance, that only one kind of sexual expression in terms of sexual orientation is healthy and other things aren't, right? So we have to really broaden the view here for it to be something that really works for the diverse group of people that we are. Um, but, you know, overall, while we'll go through this, when we say healthy and when this particular group kind of came up with this framework, what they generally mean by healthy is uh, things that are commonly experienced as beneficial and also um, that are free from abuse. The other thing to know about healthy sexual development is a lot of times when we talk about development, especially in social services or education, we think of this as being something that's only about childhood or adolescence. We don't kind of talk about the larger scope of personal development. And when it comes to sexuality, sexuality is lifelong. Um, it is generally ever shifting and changing lifelong, and so healthy sexual development is also lifelong. That said, um, we also know that like a lot of kinds of interpersonal development and really basic development, experiences and messages that we all get um, as children and as adolescents tend to be particularly sticky and particularly formative um, when it comes to the attitudes that we develop about ourselves and our own sexuality, about sexual relationships, about sexual partners, um, about sex and sexuality out and about in the world, period. Um, and so anything that gets in the way of this development or jacks it up can have lifelong impacts on sexuality and sexual relationships. And again, like a lot of kinds of interpersonal experiences, um, ideas and dynamics, the younger we are when we get them, these tend to be the more formative things. So when our influences with all of this and our experiences around all of this, our messages with all of this are really positive, that's this really great support for us as we develop through life. It's going to be easier for us to kind of create and seek out sexual lives that really do feel beneficial, partnerships that are emotionally uh, and physically healthy for us as well. On the other hand, when we have something that basically sends a wrong message, you know, and a message about things that aren't safe, that aren't beneficial, that aren't healthy, um, or someone has an experience that happens to them that um, is, is negative, right, especially if they relate it to any of these things, then it's going to be a little bit harder to develop healthy habits and to kind of picture a healthy framework. You know, one really big example that comes up a lot um, when we're talking about a, a media message um, that people are often exposed to is the idea that, for instance, possessiveness or jealousy is actually romantic and is sexy rather than is abusive. So many people growing up hearing that, we still often will have to explain to people that that's actually not, that that's not true at all, and it can be very, very hard for people to unlearn that or to develop different frameworks, even when they know intellectually that what we're saying is, of course, true. Um, one more thing I want to throw in before we quickly go through this list is that, as a lot of you probably already know, um, many children and young people have experienced sexual or other intimate um, abuse. So, you know, t teens that are 16 to 19 are three and a half more times likely than the general population to be victims of some kind of sexual violence. We know that, you know, when it comes to sexual violence that happens among the entire age spectrum, more than half of that is concentrated um, in children and in young people. And about one in six boys and one in four girls are sexually abused before 18 in the United States as of kind of estimates for right now. So when we're talking about healthy sexual development and we're talking about experiences that um, people have, you know, I think it's 
generally what happens is that people assume that there aren't any survivors, and it really, especially with what we also know about um, a lack of reporting, is probably better if we always presume that someone probably is a survivor of at least some kind um, of interpersonal or sexual abuse um, or messaging that basically enables any of these things. Because when we do that, everyone is actually included, whereas the other way around, it's a little bit more problematic. Um, and rape, challenge, uh, rape culture obviously is going to make any of this challenging. So again, that's, you know, that's a double whammy for somebody who's survived abuse or assault, um, but it's also problematic for someone who hasn't. So what I want to do is I want to just go through this and particularly pull out the pieces that I think are particularly applicable and can be, um, uh, can be extra kind of thorny issues or more challenging for someone who has um, survived abuse or assault. And that's actually most of these things. It's, it's not all of it. It's all a little bit challenging, but you'll see when we go through. Obviously, the first one there, that's freedom from unwanted activity. Um, this is, you can see, this is something that's going to get in the way right from the front when someone is abused or assaulted. So already, if, if a message has been sent in terms of someone's experience that they don't have freedom um, to have autonomy over their own bodies, that already kind of jacks up that message to say, you know, to say what should and shouldn't be happening um, when it comes to sex and sexuality. An understanding of consent and ethical conduct is also going to be an issue, particularly when we know how many uh, perpetrators of abuse will basically try and make a verbal case, either during assault, after assault, about their behavior, that there was nothing wrong with their behavior. So gaslighting and other ways of denying that what was done was an abuse is something that, you know, extra jumbles messages about what is and isn't consensual. Um, which can make things really complicated. Obviously, education about biological aspects of sexual practice is not really a real issue here. An understanding of safety, on the other hand, certainly is. And again, that can kind of go back to what we were just um, talking about with consent and ethical conduct. If someone tells us that there's nothing wrong with what we're doing, if someone even tells us that we're perfectly safe while they're in the midst of making us unsafe, it really confuses our ideas about safety. It also sends a message that, again, we, um, we don't have the right to be safe or to, be, to have safety. Agency comes in all of that as well and underscores all of this too. Now my double clicking is working. Um, resilience, I think, is an interesting one to come in here, and I'd also kind of dip down this list and also pull out um, self-acceptance and awareness and acceptance that sex can be pleasurable. Um, you know, we, we know from a lot of studies on resilience that this isn't we're not all necessarily born into this world or are, and raised in this world with, um, with the same capacity for resilience. Some of us are more resilient than others. Some of us are less resilient than others, and that's, that's just how this works. On the other hand, we know from, you know, that the healing process of, you know, after assault, not just surviving assault in a really literal way, but going through the process of healing of things like, you know, affirming your own needs, learning self-care, learning that you've a right uh, to boundaries and agencies, having to go through all of this process while still having your life, often while being unsupported in some ways, grows resilience for people. Resilience that people who haven't survived these kind of traumas might not have so much of. Um, Self-acceptance, the same thing is true. We know that in the process of healing, we have to go through a lot of, you know, kind of reframing the messages that we give ourselves if we're survivors or that we help support survivors that we're helping and having, right? That they're not broken, for instance, that they're not spoiled, that they're not a bad person, that it wasn't their fault, that their value as a human being has in no way been diminished. Um, and these are all messages that, again, it, in the process of healing and in the process of helping, we can have an opportunity to give people that people might not otherwise be getting. Um, as strange as it can sometimes sound, 
Also, having an awareness and acceptance that sex can be pleasurable can sometimes actually be something that's a little bit easier when you've had an experience of sexual violence to know what sexual violence is. This is obviously not going to be the same for everybody, and, you know, we all know that there are, you know, probably at least an equal number of, number of people who don't know when they've been abused or assaulted or haven't, um, haven't had that education or haven't gained that awareness yet. So instead of being more clear, it's more confused. The same is true about these other things like I was just talking about with resilience. Obviously, there are some people that are so, so deeply wounded and traumatized that they are less resilient rather than more for the time being and will struggle more with self-acceptance rather than less. But I just wanted to pull those three out um, just to kind of give you a picture in that there are some things that can be more challenging um, or kind of a bigger issue for people who've survived abuse or assault when those issues can also be gifts, um, as it were. What else is in here? Um, blah, 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 blah. Sorry, I'm getting a little scattered in the, in the moment. Awareness of public and private boundaries is obviously something that can be a big deal, especially when um, the sooner, if uh, let's try this again. The earlier that abuse or assault uh, sometimes happens for someone, the trickier learning all of this becomes. Boundaries are a particular issue, and again, we know this not just with sexual violence, but we know this with uh, other kinds of domestic violence as well that people grow up in. That this can be um, that these can be problems. Um, I. I want to kind of say with all of this, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later at the time, that, you know, I think it's really important that we make sure that we're kind of always, we're never pathologizing someone's sexuality because they've been abused or assaulted. It can be really easy to assume that because that's happened, right, someone who is has had sexual trauma is necessarily going to have challenges around these departments or is necessarily going to have their development um, interrupted or jacked up in some way. And while, you know, that is frequently true, um, it's not always true. And it's, you know, we... We live in a world where, um, as, as part and parcel of victim blaming, uh, anyone who's survived this kind of violence, often kind of uh, the message that you've gotten is, again, that you're sexually spoiled or broken, that you couldn't possibly have a healthy sexual life. So even when we're addressing these issues with someone, and we might be working with someone where we see that there are, um, there are parts of their sexual development that have been interrupted or have been hijacked for the time being, but I, I would encourage you when you when you're talking with them about it, to make sure that you are um, as non-judgmental about that, as that you don't um, pathologize that with them, and that none of it is presented as anything that will necessarily always be a challenge. In fact, you know, when you're there to support them in their healing process, so the likelihood of them having a really strong healing process and coming through on the other side is very good. So the likelihood of all of these things being good things instead of big challenges later is pretty good. Just kind of also eyeballing the chat as we go. Looks like you guys are all really quiet, so we're good there. Um, competence in mediated sexuality, by the way, just because everybody doesn't quite know what that means, and I think we just use that word a little bit differently here in the States, is that means sexuality in media. Um, and I think that that's one that we always want to particularly think about when it comes to um, survivors because, again, so much media, and you know, certainly this is true of a lot of pornography, but it's true of just as many um, you know, mainstream Hollywood romance movies or advertisements that somebody sees. There's a, you know, our media is very rich also, sadly, with our rape culture. So there's a lot of messages that are sent that, again, what's sexy or what's um, okay when it comes to um, sexual expressions with partners um, isn't necessarily healthy uh, and, and doesn't support people having healthy sexual development or everyone involved having sexual development. And when those messages that are negative and that um, enable rape culture kind of meet with 
anyone who has gotten those messages from their personal life experience. It can, it, what the media can do basically is then kind of validate that, yes, for instance, it's romantic or sexy for someone to stalk you. Um, and, and that's obviously something that's going to be really problematic. So um, that's something good to bear in mind. And when we're talking a little bit later about ways to have um, conversations with young people, something to know is that when you can't find kind of an easy in or something that doesn't feel too personal or too intimate when you're just starting to work with someone, talking about sex in media is always a really great front door, right? Unless, you know, they're the person in the reality show. It's not about them. It's not about you. You can talk about the issues without having it be too personal. So these are just things that kind of having, especially if you can look at that larger resource about the domains of sexual development, um, if you can just kind of think about it, not just necessarily now, but kind of as you, as you go. And again, it won't always be the same. I mean, I know when I kind of even think about myself as a sexuality educator 20 years on, there's definitely been areas where I've been stronger at one time and weaker at another. And it's not necessarily that I get stronger with everything as I keep going. It changes depending on my life experiences and kind of where I'm, where I'm at with my life at the time. Um, I, I also want to make sure that we tack on here this last bit, which is, again, we're going to, I trust everyone who's in a helping position with survivors to absolutely think of how survivors are challenged and how you can help them. Like that, you know, that's kind of the easier given. Uh, I think, and probably more more baked into all of us just coming into any kind of helping profession. What can be a little bit more challenging but is also really valuable is you know, you don't have to say that uh, sexual abuse and assault is lemons that make lemonade because that's, that's gross and it's just, it's not, we don't need to do that. What we can, what we're really talking about is that the process that we go through um, to survive something and to heal something uh, can give us things, things of value, things that people that don't have to go through that process don't necessarily have. So I think if you can think that way and you can present some things that way, um, again, that's something else that can be really watershed for people. I'm forgetting to double click. Okay, so what I'm going to do here with this, I know I was just about to say I'm going to talk really fast. I think I'm probably already talking really fast. <laughs> but I, it's, it's about to get faster. I, I have to tell you if, if it already feels fast. Is I'm just going to kind of uh, whip through a few pages of this, mostly just uh, going line by line through the list here. Again, this is just a general picture for anyone who feels like they need it, who hasn't been a young person in a long time, who hasn't talked to a lot of young people about um, sex and sexuality, or talks to young people but only their, uh, their children or their children's friends. Everything is not in here. That Guttmacher piece is a, is a really good overview. If you want a good overview specifically of uh, queer and trans youth, a really helpful resource is the report that uh, GLSEN, that's G-L-S-E-N, puts out every year. That's the school climate survey, if you want that as well. But I'm just going to give you an overview just so you can kind of, you know, feel like, feel like you know what you're talking about while, when you're talking with them. So everybody has this idea often that, especially the older people are, the more they seem to have this idea. Um, that from generation to generation of teenagers, things get so different and somehow also get kind of um, more and more sexual with every single generation. I don't, I don't even know how we figure out what is sexual in that big umbrella or not, um, but it's problematic no matter what. You know, what I, what I can tell you as someone whose work this is and is also kind of a bit of a dork when it comes to um, sex in history is that, uh, you know, for at least the last 50 years, that's a really conservative estimate, 
um, you know, kind of in the Western, if we just limit it to the Western world and developed nations, we have all had more in common with each other when it comes to, you know, our developing sexuality and being young and our sexuality than we do that's different. Um, right now, the, the biggest thing that's probably different than it was in previous generations um, is mass media uh, and technology, and then somewhat increased, and I know kind of Straight and gender conforming uh, people always want to think it's like massively increased. On the other hand, I would, I would be inclined to say it's not so much somewhat increased acceptance um, for queer and gender nonconforming identities. Other than that, it's about the same stuff. So a majority of people are still having sex, um, all various kinds of sex, uh, before they get married or without getting married. Most young people um, will engage in some form of sexual expression with a partner by their late teens, and for most of them, that will include genital intercourse. Um, most still explore sex within romantic relationships, right, so not necessarily with uh, friends with benefits or just with what people think of as more casual hookups, but with you know, what, what young people call love relationships, boyfriend, 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 girlfriend relationships. Um, but they're often short. Uh, they usually last weeks, months, or less than a year. And the younger that uh, young people are, the shorter they are. Kind of the, I think, I don't know, a, a lot of times this kind of one year is put up as like that's the big deal relationship. But for most um, teenagers in the United States, if they have sexual or romantic relationships before they're 18, uh, a year is actually a pretty long time. Um, six months is kind of going to be more the norm for people that age. So even when people are taking things very seriously and having very big experiences, we have to be aware that their relationships are not necessarily um, very long-lasting and might be what some older people might think of as casual when for a young person's experience is actually very serious. Um, social status is often a high motivation for sex. Again, this is not uh, probably unfamiliar to a lot of people. Um, this is more common, though, among cisgender boys and men or straight youth. So, you know, and, and it's all the same awful messages. We know why this is. You know, if straight guys have sex, they're studs. Uh, if girls have sex, they're sluts, right? So when we talk about even sexual choices, social status can be a big motivation in that, whereas, again, we'll often see kind of cis, straight young men really, really wanting to have sex to increase their social status, whereas the young women they might want to be having that sex with, even if they have the desire to have sex when it comes to their concerns about social status, might choose otherwise because they would lose social status points by being knowingly sexually active. Um, we do know, and this, some of this stuff is probably not that big of a surprise uh, to a lot of you, that first sexual experience, especially when we're talking about intercourse, are often described as having been unwanted sex by around 25% of young people. That's the case more uh, for girls than, than boys, but actually it's, it's, not, that, it's not that different. Um, and then the younger that a person is, when they start engaging in sex with other people, the more often that at least one of the people involved um, reports that that sex or um, that abuse was not, was not wanted or, and was not sex and was abuse. Um, outcomes from sex among teens in the U.S. are more often negative, right? So again, whether we're talking about what I was just talking about there or we're talking about unwanted pregnancy, we're talking about STI transmission, we can also pull into that um, kind of dipping back to the social issues, um, sexual harassment, peer harassment around this, getting kicked out of the house, uh, family judgment. Um, than in other developed nations, right? Even though otherwise on the data points, we seem to have young people starting to engage in sex with partners around the same age um, that we do, that, you know, that we see in other countries, but we all have, have more frequently have more negative outcomes. A lot of this um, has to do with attitudes uh, and again, kind of going back to the, the cultural issues that we have around both rape enabling and also being a pretty sex negative um, 
country. We also still, you know, oh God, a knock on all of the wood, our very recent changes in contraceptive access when it comes to um, insurance and health care are very, very recent. Like I said, hopefully not also short and gone. Um, but uh, and availability to places to get contraception, to get tests for sexually transmitted infections are still pretty limited and more concentrated in cities than they are uh, in rural areas. I'll make sure I'm staying on time here. Um, another big thing to know is that uh, around 11% currently right now of young people identify as gay, lesbian, or bisexual, um, and slightly more than that, who, though not all will identify that way, have engaged in some kind of same gender uh, consensual sexual activity. When I was kind of talking earlier about how one of the changes that we saw is somewhat more acceptance um, for queer and gender nonconforming identities, one of the reasons that I said that is if you'll look at the, these stats here about how this is going for queer and trans youth in schools when it comes to harassment and it comes to assault. And these stats are, these are at school, right? So this isn't even accounting for what has happened and what is happening outside of school. Um, these are stats right at school. And many school policies don't address any of this. Um, some actually kind of, <laughs> kind of encourage it or go along with it. For instance, a lot of school, um, a lot of schools' policies for proms and other dances still don't allow for people to come with um, same gender dates. Uh, a lot of school policies will um, will have harassment policies, but not. Um, not sexual harassment, not harassment specifically focused on uh, someone's gender identity or someone's sexual orientation. So th this is this is all kind of stuff to know. And this is you know still, especially when we're talking about um, sexual um, abuse and assault survivors, we need to know about this as well, especially when we consider that for. Um, male survivors of assault or male identifying survivors of assault, um, there's a big link between fears of assault or abuse making, I put that in the biggest bunny ears ever because it's not a real thing, making someone um, gay or otherwise queer. So all of this plays together sometimes in some pretty noxious um, and precarious ways. We also need to know too that um, when schools provide sex ed, and it's, that when is still really important in the United States because we still have more schools that either don't provide any at all or provide abstinence education that they're calling um, sex education but is not, is not sex education at all. Um, but when it's there, much of it still isn't inclusive, and that's even with a lot of comprehensive programs, right, that are otherwise accurate, that are not um, uh, religiously or value-based. Still just, they, they might not demonize uh, LGBTQ people, but, um, excuse me, they don't necessarily include us either. Um, and of course, a lot of sex ed, and that, again, that includes some, some comprehensive sex ed, stigmatizes or simply doesn't include victims and survivors of sexual assault. Now, obviously, this is a, you know, with kind of abstinence-based stuff, this might be a bit of a gimme. Um, if you're ever curious, Elizabeth Smart has said some really courageous, brave, and fantastic things about uh, how problematic it was for her um, to then, you know, having survived everything that she survived, walk into this sex education that, you know, told her she was all used up and did the weird thing that they do with the tape. Also, another thing to look up should you should you be so inclined. Um, so, you know, when we're talking about, there's a lot of messaging for with um, a lot of sex ed, for instance, that focuses a lot on how important first sexual decisions are and how important it is to decide the first person you have sex with. And again, most survivors won't have gotten this message that sex and rape are different. And so you'll have a survivor that's just, you know, kind of <laughs> sitting there taking all of this in in the, in the hurtful way that's really the only way 
um, to take it in and who's also, of course, most likely not going to say anything, even, even in private um, to teachers later. And, you know, all of these things where I'm kind of pointing out, uh, you know, lacks are really great places for, you know, people like yourselves, people like myself to, to come in and be helpers where someone otherwise might not be very well served. The looking, okay, seem to be good on comments. Um, so as it says here, as in generations before this, a lot of young people, this everybody does it um, idea, or everybody wants to do it, or of course even the, the way more horrible message, everyone has to do it, um, is still really prevalent. And in fact, one of the things that we know from data over the last 10 years is that actually, you know, the, the kind of current generation of young people most of them are actually starting to engage in sex with other people later than with generations previously, right? So even, you know, their parents' kind of ideas, if they aren't otherwise informed about at what age most uh, their children or their children's peers will be having sex might not necessarily be um, so accurate if they're based on their own experiences. You know, somebody that came of age in the 80s, you know, it's, it's radically different. I, I think if, if I was here now, almost none of my friends uh, would be having sex with each other at the same age that then almost everybody was. Um, and, that's, and that's a big message too, especially I think that's another one with survivors. The pressure can be so steep for you to get over your trauma um, as if you could, right? And uh, get through your healing process and get to the point where you can have sex with other people without it being a problem. That's often a big kind of self-proof point of, I, I, I must be over this if I can have sex with other people. Um, obviously all of that can be really problematic. Um, and what underscores that is if somebody thinks they have to get there, right, and if they take whatever time they need um, to process and to heal, that, that they're going to miss the boat or that they will be identified um, as somehow abnormal or broken, that's a lot of pressure for someone. When it comes to sexual communication uh, with young people, I think, I think older people right now I hear often seem to assume that like everybody young can talk about sex right now and it's older people that can't. And I, I, I mean, I wish that was true. I don't wish that older people couldn't. I wish that everybody could and that certainly included young people. But I, my, in my experience, that isn't actually true. I think that younger people right now, when we're talking about people who are like late high school and college age, um, are probably better than their counterparts from a generation ago. Um, but more often than not, we're seeing the same kind of discomforts, except that what we can see is that there's more talk about sex, um, but it's what somebody would say, you know, is sexy talk. It's all of the stuff that they either know is going to turn them on or turn a partner on or suspect, right, or are trying to rather than communicating about things like, for instance, limits and boundaries, which might be assumed to be a buzzkill um, or not a, just not a turn on, just not sexy. Um, and so when it comes to um, arenas like that, we're not really seeing more communication. We're seeing um, some problems. And if you have the idea that you're talking about it more, because you are talking about it more, but only the sexy stuff, it can be hard to see when you're not communicating. And specifically, obviously, when it comes to something like consent, when we want people to be better about consent and we want to support people in having a sexual life in which consent is a very big part, it's really important that we're talking to them about communication and teaching them and helping them how to better communicate. Part and parcel of that um, is that survivors still often don't want to share that they've been uh, abused or assaulted. I think it can be easy to assume that with more um, talk about sexual violence kind of in our media, in social media, that younger people will necessarily feel um, more able to do that and more supported. I think though what you have to also recognize is that uh, when you 
when you can see, for instance, when you're using social media, someone get bullied or harassed because they've uh, put out there that they're a survivor, you, you, you no longer have to imagine how many people may or may not do that to you. So, you know, in some respects, this um, kind of the discourse changing and being more prevalent out there can be there's good parts to it and there's some challenging parts to it as well. Um, and this last bit is like, I mean, it's, it's like super, super obvious, but um, cell phones, webcams, and the Internet, are they are core parts um, of sexuality, sex, and relationships. So it's just, it's some stuff that you, depending on how old you are and what your personal experience is and your background is, you might have to make some adjustments around. Like, for instance, the idea that people can't have serious relationships that are online, or people can't necessarily have sexual relationships that are only online, or how we deal with abuse when it's happening via a phone um, rather than in person. And these are obviously, um, there's a lot of pieces to go into a lot of things, and you can find specialized information on all of this, but it's, but it's something to seek out if you, if you feel a little bit behind with it. I'm just going to catch up on my notes, take a breath. So much like I did with the, um, with the last list, I just, I'm going to kind of stroll us through this one. I kind of touched base on some of these things as we, as we went before, uh, but I want to make sure that I um, pull them out here. And I'll say that, you know, the, these things are, are mostly my experiences of working with young people and what I see then also with my staff working with young people um, with this stuff. And we're, you know, we're in an interesting position with Scarletine and uh, people who are survivors of abuse or assault coming to us and asking us about these things because they're, they've come to us usually having looked up um, something to do with sex rather than something to do with assault, and then they will often discover that we are a safe place for them to talk about these things and ask about these things as a survivor. So it's a little bit different than probably um, a lot of people's experience, which might be the other way around, right, which is that you might be identified as someone safe to talk to about abuse or assault and how safe or relevant it is for you to talk about um, sex and sexuality and sexual relationships might be the question mark. Um, but what I'd say to that is, you know, they, they find that out about us just by observing, just by watching, and just by seeing our comfort with both of these things. So, um, yeah, that, there it is. Sorry, my brain is going a little south on me today. Some of this stuff might be obvious. Um, maybe all of this stuff might be obvious. Hopefully I can add a little bit more to this if, if all of it is already known to you. So the super obvious, especially if someone is a very recent survivor, right, is that PTSD and then trauma cues and body memories during around sex or other intimacy um, are really frequent when it comes to both someone's experiences with a wanted sexual life, if they're having them, but also with someone's fears. You know, we hear a lot from people who want to either, you know, pursue a consensual sex life from the front because they haven't before or want to kind of resume their sex life but are really, really worried that this will happen to them um, and that if this does happen to them, right, that's just, that's, it's terrible, it's unmanageable, and that they can't have it or pursue any kind of sex life until, you know, absolutely this won't happen to them, even though, of course, that is mostly going to be impossible um, as something that will never, ever happen to any of us who've been traumatized in any way at all. Um, so some of it is we need to always work on giving messaging to say these things might happen, and they probably will happen at, at least at some point, if not frequently. Um, and it's okay for them to happen. You're gonna, we can help you figure out with whom you feel okay and more or less safe um, having them happen with, what you want 
uh, but also then how to manage them when it happens, which certainly includes how do we talk to our partners to say, this might happen to me, just so you know. And, you know, it's always good to remind them, too, that they, they don't have to give somebody the play-by-play of everything that's happened to them when it comes to their trauma. They don't even necessarily have to say what kind of trauma it is. They can just say that they've had trauma um, and talk about it from there. Um, And this can actually be more likely sometimes for people in the closer relationships rather than something that's more more casual uh, and less kind of emotionally intimate, which is that the safer people can feel and the closer they get to somebody, the more vulnerable or open they get. Um, And so sometimes it can actually be easier um, to have trauma cued um, in in those situations. I mean, the the bonus there is that it's also usually safer. um, And usually in those relationships, if we've helped people to to kind of be working on this, they've established practices um, for coping with all of this and have a partner that's accepting of all of this. So it doesn't have to be terrible. Um, there can obviously be difficulty building trust um, or investing their trust wisely uh, and in choosing trustworthy partners. Again, the earlier any kind of abuse happens, the more it can kind of jack us up, and especially if there's a pattern of abuse that's continued or messages from abuse haven't been interrupted and corrected with healthier messages learned. Um, people can be completely trustworthy, but the, the problem is, they're, I'm sorry, can invest their trust openly, but in, in people and relationships where they shouldn't be. Um, so kind of talking about when do we trust people, when does it make sense to trust people is a thing that we'll often have to do. Um, A lot of survivors have a hard time asking partners for things that they need and even just things that they want uh, because of or related to surviving abuse. Certainly for people who have been abused um, because of asserting their own needs, wants, you know, separate self at all, that can be a, a really big deal. People can be afraid to um, to ask for things that might um, they might feel concerned are kind of like asking for abuse. Like if someone, for instance, has the idea that if they voice any kind of sexual desire at all, that means that they then have to allow someone else to have whatever kind of sex with them they want. They can be afraid um, to ask about this. And especially if that's how they've conceptualized what happened to them is that it's like a lot of abuse, um, sexual abuse and assault situations for particularly uh, high school and college age people. If they've started out um, with an acquaintance or with someone they've you know, been in a relationship with, the idea that they were open to them sexually at all is what made abuse happen or what made them deserving of it is still unfortunately really common. There can certainly be difficulty understanding what consent is uh, and understanding that it needs to be respected. Um, One kind of big thing I think that happens is to some people is that uh, there's this idea that if some, once, if you've survived sexual violence, that then anything that just isn't sexual violence, right? Like it it still might not be so healthy. It might not be very communicative. Someone might not really be including you fully in in a process of consenting or necessarily giving you the message that really any answer that you had um, would be an acceptable answer to something that they wanted um, is, is fine just because it's not abuse or assault, which of course, you know, (laughs) <laughs> isn't necessarily true. Someone might feel that that's, that that's fine, but that's not what we're talking about when we want to help people facilitate and create sexual lives um, that are beneficial to them um, and that are really about them, that they're a real part of. I apologize. I'm feeling like I'm a, a little mushy here. I'm just uh, getting back in the groove of work things after recovery from something else. So I'm a little less sharp. If I'm floaty, I appreciate uh, your working with me here. 
Uh, I put self, sex as self-harm at the top of this. One of the kind of biggest mythologies that I've run into about abuse and assault survivors is that any and all sex, especially if it's, you know, someone's idea of too close to when abuse or assault has occurred, must be someone's seeking to harm themselves, right? That it can't possibly be someone, some, a part of someone's healing process, but not even that, just healthy or okay, or an earnest expression of a survivor's own sexual desire, not a feeling of obligation, not a reenactment of their abuse in some way. Um, so this this idea that this is how all sex is is you know it's simply it's completely wrong. On the other hand, we want to acknowledge that there are certainly ways, and this is true, you know, whether or not someone has survived any kind of abuse, that the way that someone goes about sexual expression, absolutely, of course, we know that it can be harmful to other people, but it can also be harmful to ourselves. If, for instance, uh, for instance, a survivor has had cemented for them the idea that their only value um, is as a, sexual, a provider of sex to other people, and they go about sex with other people to kind of, you know, to really bake that in as a way of hurting themselves emotionally. That's a way for sex to be self-harm. Um, someone who feels so wounded or broken from abuse or assault or like the idea that everyone will see them as sick or sullied, who intentionally has a lot of unprotected sex, thinking if it gets them sick, who cares? Um, people think they're sick already. That could be another way to go about this as self-harm. Um, so you want to, again, we want to just kind of look out for this. Um, and, and the biggest piece, and we'll get to this in a minute, just in case it's kind of um, obtuse as to how you figure out any of this, where somebody's at, what somebody needs, what you can offer them, is that um, we're doing more listening than we're, than we're talking, right? So you don't have to have any ideas from the front about if what someone is doing is or isn't harmful to themselves. The longer that you listen to them, um, the more likely they are to keep talking because they see that you're listening, hopefully without you know, a whole lot of reaction. Um, and the more that you observe them and listen to them, the more and more these things will just become apparent. Uh, like I said in kind of the page previous, one really big thing that we see a lot of with survivors is a worry that if they seek out consensual sex, it will become abuse or assault. Um, and that's, you know, either in that very moment that they're seeking out or just overall, right? So you start having consensual sex with a partner that at the front is consensual, but then this idea that in time um, it will all necessarily become uh, abuse. Obviously, these fears are very much enabled and supported by a misunderstanding of what sexual violence and abuse is all about when it comes to the motivations of the perpetrator a lot. So this is something that we can often help with just with education. Um, but, it's, but it's also something about people's attitudes about sex period. So that's another thing that you might also have to work with and talk to somebody about is not just saying that there's a difference between sex and rape, but that sex in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing or a dangerous thing or something where at best people are controlling themselves and not hurting each other. Um, and that obviously this next thing kind of feeds into this, which is that there is a common view of sex or sexuality that's defined or only understood as sexual violence when that's been your norm or when, you know, you've just had a really big experience that as far as you can tell, if you've classified sexual violence as sex, this must be what it is. That's, it's all about violence. And again, there's a lot of messages in our culture that underscore that um, and really drive it home. So that's something that we have to kind of do double battle with. Um, another big one, kind of shooting back to the PTSD, is struggling with staying present instead of numbing out. And I would also add is um, not even recognizing from the front that you can have 
sex that you want, um, that's healthy, that's not abusive, and be present having survived assault. There's a, um, uh, I, f- I feel like I hear with some frequency from survivors, especially really recent survivors and younger survivors, this idea that what they'll need to learn in order to be able to have sex with other people is to just tune it all out. Um, and obviously that's that is problematic in every way it could possibly be problematic um, but that's but that's something that we can we can tell them and we can tell them again from education that if we're if someone is basically kind of numbing out or putting themselves out of the picture and dissociating when it comes to sex that's a really good message that probably either the situation itself very specifically isn't right or maybe they're just not at sex with partners just yet in their um, in their process with healing um, and that if they're staying present in it like they, they can go at it that way and it, it can be okay uh, this one is one that I has always been really difficult for me personally um, which is when you have when we have conversations with uh, sexual abuse or assault survivors that want to talk to us about their the sex lives that they want with the person who um, who abused or attacked them, uh, and obviously as people that want to prevent violence and get people out of violence, you know we're all going to know that that really the best answer there is to to get away from that person and to stay away from that person, um, and we can of course say that, uh, but at the same at the same time we want to make sure that we're not um, we're not cutting off from them feeling hurt in that or we're not simplifying a really common and really confusing experience that a lot of people have um, who have been abused or assaulted by people they know which is most people who have been abused or assaulted which is that their feelings for them are often very complicated and abuse or assault doesn't necessarily turn off feelings of sexual desire that they had before but I said for me Personally, this is one when we're kind of going back to areas that some of us are great at and some of us aren't good at. This is one I, I'm still, I'm a lot of years on in doing this, and I still struggle with it um, quite a lot. Uh, one kind of last biggie is uh, sexual same or sexualization. So going, I think I've talked about this a little bit, which is seeing yourself as sexually broken. Um, and when you do that, you can see having sex with someone else as something that will fix you, right, or as a way to prove to yourself that you're normal, even if, you know, being in that experience is actually not pleasant, not great, may even be um, create more trauma and be terrible, uh, or as someone only being valuable as a sexual object or a provider of sex. This is something else, again, where, you know, unfortunately a lot of media messaging, a lot of um, any kind of cultural messaging, too, that puts a whole lot of focus on um, virginity, specifically virginity as it's most commonly defined, which is to talk about whether it's, it's not even whether someone's had intercourse or not, right? It's usually whether someone has had a, a penis put into an orifice of their, a genital orifice of their body or not. Um, so, so this is, you know, this is a big one that will, will have, and it, people go back and forth a lot of the times with, um, with this as well as some of these other things. So there can kind of be a lot of cycles where people will feel, they won't feel so ashamed. They'll feel pretty kind of ready to, to go in and have a sexual experience. And then they'll seek that out and either just the experience, you know, full stop, even if it went you know, otherwise objectively well uh, can create some feelings of shame or just something happens in there, again, none of which may be um, particularly big in any other context. But, for instance, if someone asks someone to do something sexually and someone slut shames them or they, you know, just say that something about their body part is gross, and any of these things are things that have been associated with abuse or assault for that person, it can obviously be really impactful and really, um, really traumatic. So uh, things all change as we go as well. 
these questions that I've um, that I've got here, just again, so you know, I, I always feel like it's so weird when I'm in the position where somebody that's done something for a really long time is is talking about it. I feel like it's really easy for me to assume that they've kind of got it all figured out, right? Because <laughs> they sound like they know that they've got it all figured out, which may or may not be true of me and my flaky little self today. But um, you know, I'm still I, I'm still kind of asking myself myself these kinds of questions all day, every day, every time um, I have these conversations. Uh, you know, this, this kind of arena of work and really this place where victim advocacy and helping and sex education um, and sexual health uh, collide is really complex and nuanced and layered and sophisticated and of course, it's it's all it's never going to be the same for any two people even when you know there are some things that we may see more often or we may see less often and all of it of course hinges on our own personal development including not only just our own experiences with abuse or assault but just you know our experience as people living in a world in which we are surrounded by abuse or assault and surrounded by problematic messages about abuse or assault. Um, so I would encourage you to just get in a practice of kind of always asking yourself these kinds of things and, and looking at these kinds of things. I feel like, too, it, it models something really great um, for people we're working with. And we can, ask, we can ask them, we can put this out there to them um, as something to ask of us, right? So instead of trying to kind of be the detective and figure out what we what we can do to you know help them so perfectly we can just say how can i support you in this and what can i give you to you know to support you in the positives but to also really help you through your challenges um you know and also to say things like by all means if even in this conversation you feel like i'm running over you or i'm not asking you if you, what you want to be part of enough please stop me and call me out because it's really important to me um, that even this conversation is something that feels like we both want to be here and it's happening in a way and it's something we're both going about that works for both of us and feels right for both of us so the last thing that I want to do is just do some uh, quicker overview about just, you know, some kind of tips that I feel like I can share um, in having these conversations and being the kind of person uh, that young people are more likely to feel comfortable talking with in um, creating the kind of conversations that are really rich for everybody involved, that feel safe for everybody involved, that, you know, doesn't, if, if anybody gets weird out, it's like weirded out in a funny way instead of in, an, in a really uncomfortable way. Um, Karen Rain, who's a sex educator in uh, Austin, Texas, wrote a book for parents called Breaking the Hush Factor, which I think is, is probably the, the best and simplest thing that I've read for parents in which there was nothing I read that I wasn't cheering on. Um, and this list, this graphic that you're seeing here, and one of the attached files that you have is kind of a bigger breakdown of this, is her 10 rules um, for talking with teenagers about sex. Now, this is aimed at at parents primarily. And I would say that there's a couple of things in here that I actually don't think would be kind of the right thing at all um, for us as helpers, or you'd be fine, but that doesn't necessarily have to be true. For instance, as a sex educator, I get way more than one question because young people are coming to me to talk about these things, and as long as they want to be there, they're delighted uh, for me to ask questions, and they certainly get more than one question. Um, this kind of the never surrender thing at the end is really about parents kind of not giving up in this conversation, and that is really the opposite of what, what we need to do, right? We need to make our conversations that we have about sex with young people as, as helpers only be something that we're having when it is something that they want to be doing and that they want to include us in. But I pulled out five of these pieces that I think are really relevant um, and are super helpful and really kind of cut to the, the chase of what's most important. Um, know yourself is a big one. Starting with what we did with the, um, with the values clarification, right? We, we do exercises like that or 
think about these things or even just kind of reflect on our day at the end of a, of a work day, reflect on an interaction at the end of it so that we can better know who we are. Um, that helps us know our strengths and our weaknesses, you know, our gifts and our failings. We can know the things that we're better at, and we can also know the things that we really want to make sure that we have somebody to refer them to because that's just not what we're good at at all or just even what we necessarily want to be good at. Maybe it's just not our skill set. Um, and if we, know, if we know who we are, and I think, you know, it's really important to include our limitations in that and to make sure that we don't get hung up on that we have limitations because, of course, we all have limitations. Um, we're going to be doing a, a better job of, of directing people to the, the best people for them uh, to talk to. Um, that kind of links to part of the next piece, which is to, to remember that it's, not, uh, that it's not about us. Obviously, uh, we're going to feel really good uh, if and when someone picks us for this, this kind of, you know, these really important conversations about really complicated and vulnerable parts of, of life. And if we can have a really great talk and someone says, oh, you offered me this wonderful, wonderful thing, of course we're going to feel good about ourselves. And that's going to be, um, that's going to be a nice boost to our self-esteem. And we're going to, we'll have done a good job, which is obviously a good thing. Um, at the same time, I think that we have to remember that we don't do any less of a good job when we're a really good switchboard. Um, so when we don't make it about us and we make it about how can we serve this person best, one of those ways that we can often do that is to say, to make sure that we're the right person for them to be having that conversation with in our estimation. And if we know that we're not, or we know ourselves well enough to just know that we're okay at this, but our coworker down the hall is a badass with it, um, it's, it's going to be a lot easier to refer them to someone else. Um, there's kind of an extra piece of that too, both in terms of not being too attached to kind of, you know, being the, being the hero of the piece um, and also not making this too much about us, which is that when someone has been abused or assaulted, anything and everything that we can do um, to center things on them and on their needs and on their wants and on their boundaries um, and not have them feel like they owe us anything or they have to be extra, extra careful about um, our feelings or only say things that they think we like or will approve of, we do them a really big service with really, you know, just a, just a pretty small thing, just by not letting our ego um, run wild. Um, listening. Uh, instead of, of talking, I always, one big piece that I'll kind of tell our educators at Scarletine when I'm training them um, is that, you know, even when, even when we are talking, if we can work to make it more active listening. So rather than someone says something and then, we answer the question um, and then go on a lecture and then, you know, tell them a whole bunch of other things that they haven't even necessarily asked us for, but we're guessing. <laughs> we're just on our thing. Who knows? We instead really try hard to, um, to respond with questions so that what we're doing is we're, we're listening even when we're talking. Um, more than we're talking. And again, this helps with boundaries. That, that can be great education all by itself. Somebody doesn't even have to necessarily know they're getting it um, for a survivor about what healthy boundaries are, if we're asking them if things are okay with them, if we're listening and waiting um, to jump in until they ask us for something, until they ask for our opinion or ask for information. And a lot of the times when it comes to these topics, someone might not really be asking for information. They might simply want to talk about it with someone who is safe for them to talk about it with, um, who they feel comfortable talking to. Um, the piece that talks about pleasure and pain, what the, what the gist of that is, is that sex and sexuality is, can obviously be 
really happy making and really beneficial and have a whole lot to do with pleasure. It can also be disappointing. Um, it can, for as much as something might physically feel good, it can physically feel bad. For as much as it can emotionally feel good, it can emotionally feel bad. Um, and that's not necessarily talking about that there's what's healthy and what's abuse. That's this kind of other piece which can be particularly confusing sometimes for someone who has survived abuse or assault, which is, again, that you know, the pain that we might feel from any of these things might not necessarily be abuse or assault. We can have a lot of things happen that are painful. You know, somebody, you go to kiss somebody and you bump heads. That can be really painful. Someone doesn't mean to cross your lines. They misunderstand what you said. Or, you know, we get this a big one a lot. Someone asks a young person if they want to do X sexual thing using this slang term that the other person doesn't want to ask them, what does that mean? Because uh, they don't know, so they say sure. And then someone goes to do something and it it, you know, everything goes all sideways because ultimately someone said yes to something that they didn't know what it was. Um, no one meant to hurt anybody there, but things were still painful. Um, and help, helping survivors to know that, right, there can be this, this whole range of stuff here and that even in consensual sexual activities, things might not always be great. That doesn't necessarily mean that um, they or, or sex for them is forever broken. Um, a big one that will get sometimes is survivors that are having um, genital pain with genital sex assume that it has to be about surviving abuse or assault when sometimes it's just about them not using lubricant um, rather than rather than that. Oof, getting there. Um, so Karen, Karen says, bring it on for this, which is to say, you know, she's inviting people that are having these conversations to be to be brave and to be fearless. And you know, what I'd say in this particular situation is that um, someone who has survived abuse and assault, and is an adolescent asking someone else, often even in our case, no, also not an adolescent, about sex and sexuality is being really courageous. Um, you know, they, they know, you, you really, I don't think, I don't think you can be a, a young person in our world and not know that they're taking a pretty big chance that they might put something out there that somebody judges them about, that someone might even be in some way verbally or emotionally abusive um, to them over, that they might shut them down, that they might shame them more when they already feel shame, that they might take something away from them, uh, that they might validate a fear, right? So a young person wants to talk to you about a sexual fear that's unreasonable, Maybe it's not unreasonable. Maybe what they're going to find out is the bad news. So it's, um, you know, it, it takes a lot of bravery and it takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of that just for someone who hasn't experienced trauma as a young person to talk to someone about sex. Um, and for a lot of us, when, when that's happening, you know, th people don't know us <laughs> very well yet at all, especially if we're new to them as a helper or or an agency. Um, so it's quite a leap of faith that they're taking in us. And so, I, you know, I'd encourage us to always make sure that we are doing so in kind um, and we are reciprocally giving them the same kind of bravery and courage. Um, and one of the big things with that, I think, is, is being okay with making mistakes. I think because, as a group of people who are um, – better educated than most about trauma, sometimes we can be overly cautious because we, you know, we, we don't want to harm anyone. We don't want to hurt someone. We know the impacts that harm can have, so we're careful. Um, at the same time, I think that we have to remember that, you know, that, that that's there. Right? Like we're, we're, we're already good there. Probably our awareness is already really excellent. And if we make a mistake, we can, we can own our mistake. We can take responsibility for it. Um, and that's not necessarily a, a problem for a young person. I think that um, 
I think that the better risk to take is to go ahead and kind of go all in with them uh, as much on their terms as possible um, with this stuff and, and pull it back as need be um, than, than to be cautious and not give them all we can possibly give them. So I've just got a few last things for you, and then I'm going to uh, put my, I think we should have at least five minutes or so for some questions. So I only see, I think, one right now. So if anybody kind of has had any in their head that they um, want to throw out there for the last few minutes, by all means, now would be a great time to do that. So kind of my, you know, my last bits are that um, we want to be careful uh, to ourselves identify someone else's sex and sexuality issues as connected to their abuse or assault. You know, if someone tells us that they feel um, something about their sexuality, their sex life, some concern that they have is connected to their abuse and their assault, Again, we can start by listening, and obviously some things are going to be pretty obvious. If someone keeps telling us that they keep having um, panic attacks during something that we know from their story of abuse is very similar to their story of abuse, and there's nothing else like that in their life, it's, it's pretty easy to say, well, yeah, that, that sounds like that probably is about this. Um, but again, that's that kind of response is more in reaction to them than from the front. So, you know, be, be mindful and careful, especially about the stuff that's so easy to fall into when people generalize um, about this. For just as, as an example, a lot of times if, uh, if an, a, a sexual violence survivor is engaging in or even just interested in um, group sex of any kind, it's just kind of given a blanket assumption that that must somehow be about their abuse or assault, which who knows? It might be for that person. On the other hand, there are an awful lot of people that are also interested in or fantasize about that or engage in that who have not, who have not experienced sexual violence. Um, we want to also remember, too, that a young person that you're talking to isn't just an assault survivor kind of dealing with sex and sexuality. They're also a young person dealing with sex and sexuality, which is thorny for pretty much, you know, every person, period, but particularly for young people for whom it's new, for whom avenues um, to talk about it are limited, for whom people to talk about it with who can have these conversations and know what they're talking about can be difficult um, to find and sometimes reminding survivors with things that they're worried about that are things that you also know people who aren't survivors are worried about for instance you know not feeling a hundred percent about their body or how it looks or you know having some fears about something physically hurting or not right these things aren't exclusive just to survivors and so we can kind of you know remind survivors that they're not, they're not alone in this and that they have concerns or, or issues or challenges in common with people that have also not survived abuse or assault, some of whom may be people that they're sexual with themselves. Um, anything that you can do to help with the pacing of sex and intimacy for a survivor I've found to be a big deal, especially, you know, when, when you survive abuse, if someone shows up who is clearly pretty great, right, and not um, at all abusive, and, you know, heck, maybe that's even somebody that you disclose to who is really wonderful and supportive about that, um, it can understandably be really, really easy to rush in. And, you know, the dangers of kind of rushing in and going too fast isn't just, you know, someone could be abusive and you didn't see it coming. It can be that you don't have time uh, to set up things like birth control and to negotiate safe, safer sex, or you make all kinds of kind of emotional commitments to somebody before you really even know if you like them well enough um, to want to make those commitments, or all of a sudden everybody knows that you're in this kind of relationship when you weren't necessarily ready for that. And again, that's something with young people with pacing often need a little bit of help with it, but I think it's a, it can be a particularly big deal um, for survivors. And I don't mean to kind of go on and on and on about this, but anything you can do um, to make clear that sexual assault and abuse 
um, and sex are are they're not the same thing. Um, their their sex life and their um, their abuse history are are different things. Uh, we want to be supportive of their relationships. That's just a huge kind of young people and older people thing. Period. Older people are generally pretty bad about teenagers with relationships, particularly about diminishing them um, or being hyper-concerned simply because a young person is kind of in thrall um, and fascination. And that's a place, too, where if you, if, you want a, um, if you want a good place to kind of make clear to them that you're trustworthy um, and that you're safe to talk to and that they can tell you other loaded things, simply being an adult who's supportive of their um, their wanted relationships as a young person is a is a really good way to to prove that you know they, if they if they were to let you in they would probably be making a good choice the very last thing is just that we you know I, I we need to support and believe in um, in the strength of survivors um, to have a healthy sex life right I think it again if we're concerned about someone um, doing okay, uh, and it's it's a it's a good concern. It's not necessarily coming from a bad place. Um, it's all right, except for that place where we might not necessarily be su supporting the the strength and the resilience that they have, and they're moving into um, the kind of life that they want when they're ready for it. I'm gonna yeah, I'm like I'm gonna super quick jump to questions because I got away from myself there. So I've got two. Um, so uh, Melanie has asked, uh, with cell phones and Internet activity, if I'm seeing anything with youth um, who are sexually exploited uh, and if that's a, conver a common conversation with them. Certainly I'd say, you know, there's this kind of whole other realm of abuse that we didn't um, really have before, which is, which is online and mobile tech abuse. There are different ways for people to abuse people than there were before with that, and certainly there are um, different ways to, um, for people to, to meet young people to abuse um, that's there, and, and in spaces that often aren't necessarily um, supervised, right? But it doesn't necessarily have to mean with, a, with an, a parent or an adult sitting right over their shoulder um, looking, but, you know, even that there have been conversations with people about how, for instance, are we safe in online spaces? What do we do when we don't feel safe in online spaces? To whom do we report problems that we have? What does it mean, right, if like everyone in a comment section seems to be ganging up on this? Does that mean that that's right? Um, and there are, if you look in the resource section of the, um, the attached uh, pages to this, there are a couple um, good books in there that I think um, are great on this. Dana Boyd's It's Complicated would be the one that I would particularly suggest. And okay, I have two more minutes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab the last one here. This is from Ava. And it says, how do we respond to a young client who's been sexually abused in the past and now wants to be sexually active with the desire to only experience pleasure? I have a client who is hypersexualized since her childhood sexual abuse and is now a teenager who is very interested in having sexual relationships without emotional attachment. You know, the thing that I'd say about that is that that's not necessarily a problem. Um, you know, we... You, you, we always kind of say this to, to young people when they'll say someone wants to have sex without feelings. It's actually impossible for us to have sex without feelings. We can't even masturbate without feelings, right? Like we're, we're going to have feelings. That's part and parcel of everyone's sexuality. What kind of feelings we have um, obviously can be all over the place. But I think that's something to know, too, is that, um, you know, it can be very empowering and liberating for people to have sex outside of the context of committed relationships, which can equal relationships in which someone feels obligated, obligated to be sexual, also obligated to be in the relationship full stop. Someone who just wants to, you know, really put most of their focus on their physical pleasure or even their emotional pleasure but just theirs and can do that in a way without hurting themselves or other people, right? And by hurting themselves, I'm saying they can find partners that are actually safe partners, for instance, for them to do this. I, I think that it's really important to, 
not to assume that that's problematic. In fact, that could be a really important part of someone's kind of healing around their sexuality, which is to follow their own desires rather than being the victim of someone else's desires. Um, this is something, too, and I'll say this kind of with any of this, especially since I've, I've crammed so much into such a small period of time. I'm always open um, to anyone kind of contacting me after the fact. Like I said, this, this particular area of stuff is my heart of hearts. So as long as I can make some time and find some time um, to gab about this stuff, if you want to kind of take conversations further or ask for some you know, kind of private time uh, to talk about this, I'm happy to make it when I can. So there's my contact stuff um, right there with my cell. That's my work cell. I'd ask you text me first. Um, otherwise, I won't answer the phone in the first place. Um, and again, I, I really want to thank everybody for being here and dedicating your time and your energy um, and your lovely afternoon that we're having to all of this and um, to being patient with me in my scatter. Thank you, Heather. Thank you for presenting that. As a reminder, please fill out the short evaluation and let us know if others were on the webinar with you. You can email that to Donna at wixap.org. A recording of today's webinar and materials will be posted on our website under trainings and recorded webinars. And that should do it. Everyone have a great day. Thank you, Heather. Thank you.